way of putting it would be is that they were actually moving away from faith and getting back into the law side of things. And the problem with getting to the law side of things, we understand that the law cannot save you. It has a purpose to show you that you need a savior. So just a couple of things we need to understand there. The word gospel means what? Very simple, but what does it mean? Good news. Good news, absolutely. So do you think it's good news? I mean, this is, this is what Paul is uh, really marveling at. Um, when you receive grace and you understand that you only save by faith uh, in Christ, to then say, okay, well, let's leave all that and go back to works. Let's try to work our way to salvation. That's not good news. It's actually quite bad news. I mean, if we are forced to try to please God in ourselves again, it cannot be good news. What? Why is grace, why is the new covenant good news? Pastor I. Yes, go for it. Because we don't actually have to do anything. So it means no work for us. Exactly. Eventually, yeah, exactly. So literally, I mean, this is the exciting part about faith and grace is that you don't work for your salvation anymore. In fact, that's the, the analogy or the, the word grace broken up means God's riches at Christ's expense. So it's literally... Mm -hmm being given something for free and then still determining that you want to pay for it. It makes no sense. So that's what, what this is. This is what's mob. This is what Paul's marveling at. You know, you were given a gift and then you literally now are putting the gift aside and you saying you can do a better job, literally. So um, verse seven says there, which is not another gospel. Okay. But there are obviously some people uh, verse 7 says which is really not another gospel but there are obviously some people masquerading as teachers who are disturbing and confusing you with a misleading counterfeit teaching and want to distort the gospel some other translations use the word perverted okay the gospel of Christ twisting it into something it is absolutely not okay just hold on for a moment let's just Let's just think about that whole statement. There are some teachers that are coming to you and they're masquerading uh, as teachers of, of Christ. And um, is that happening today? Do we see this happening in the modern church today? Mm, absolutely. Yes, we do. Okay. Give me some examples. How is that happening today? By false teachings and false preachings. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, false teaching. I yeah. have an example in the, communities that I, in the communities that I work um, work in, uh, people, Christians, believers sometimes visit prophets for advice, but they actually have to pay for the advice. Yeah, that's right. So, you, I mean, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's amazing. We live in this modern world. We have access to some of the greatest preachers on earth, yet somehow people find false teachers very alluring i mean they are even i mean the amount of cults that are operate all over the world and let me just say probably even in our area you'll probably find some cults operate in our area it's amazing how people move away from i'm going to use the word now and i really want you to understand what i'm saying a simple gospel to something that is totally confusing and never achieve, achievable. Why do you think people are always looking to find a way to try and please God in their own strength? Can someone help me with that? Why do you think that, I mean, if you look at the prophet, like the false prophets, if you look at some of the, the, the cults out there, you have cult leaders that convince, for example, married women, that they need to be married to the prophet. Leave your husband and be married to me. You have one guy that has like 10, 20 wives, fathers, 50, 60 children. How is it possible that someone can really just give up their whole life while the gospel is actually simple? Can someone help me with that? Try help me understand how this is possible. 
I think people want guidance in their lives. And if you're not getting the revelation that Jesus is not only our savior, but through the Holy Spirit, he leads us as a good shepherd and he guides us. If you haven't got that revelation, you're going to look to a human person for that guidance. And sometimes that human person is a wolf in sheep's clothing. It could be a person who preaches a law all the time, as we've mentioned, and then you are full of fear. Or he can preach a kind of gospel where it, it's all happy clap. It's all, you know, he, there's not a father in heaven, but a grandfather in heaven and anything goes. And, and, you know, don't worry what you do. You can live in sin. You can have many girlfriends. I think neither of those are gospels. And people fall in sometimes into one extreme or the other. Um, and people want guidance because life can be confusing and challenging. And if you're not getting it from Jesus, you're getting it from someone else. Or another okay. religion. So, Simon, let me just stop you there. Because what we find is that there are Christians. There are people that... Uh, I know personally, I won't mention the person's name in case someone knows him, but from our previous church, there was a, a man there that was on fire for God, just a heart for evangelism. All he wanted to do was to go out and preach the gospel, get people saved. In fact, he, he went so far going to some areas that were very dangerous. He actually got stabbed in the hand preaching the gospel, but he wouldn't give up. This same guy that was so on fire and passionate for God, I still remember him clearly coming to my office one day and he had started with a, a Bible school that the AFM, the local AFM church were hosting. And the AFM church didn't know that this particular pastor actually belonged to a cult that they allowed to teach their Bible school. And what they believed was in the a, a teaching of the, I'm just going to use it. I don't want to go into the whole detail, but a teaching where only white people, would go to heaven. They believed in a teaching called the lost 10 tribes of Israel. And so what happened was only these 10 tribes were the called out ones. And the amazing part about their teaching was the 10 tribes were the British, were the Afrikaners, were, were the American nation. It was the Australian nation. Uh, amazing how they came up with this. Here's a guy that was sold out for Jesus. And all of a sudden gets pulled into this. My question is, just like what Paul, now we need to, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you all this for a reason, because I want you to understand what Paul is dealing with. We think it's just a law grace thing. No, we're talking about people that had an interaction with Paul himself. One of the greatest biblical teachers that there ever has been besides Jesus Christ, okay? Two-thirds of the New Testament is written by this man. Yet there's a church in Galatia, in, in, in a, I don't know how long it took, but in a short time, they literally went back to the law. So here's Trevor Barnes, uh, a, a, another guy that I knew, who also decided to, to leave the faith to go to something that was so warped. Why, why do you think that takes um, place? Pastor, could it yes. be pride? Could it be personal pride? It's got a part to play, definitely. I'll explain why I agree with you later. Who else? Um, but Pastor, maybe it's got something to do with maturity and not growing. And then Absol like something like that. Absolutely. A big part to play in that too. I'll explain why I agree with you a little bit later as well. Anyone else want to give me give it a go? Well, I think that um, um, the Judaizers... Uh, uh, perhaps thought that they owned Jesus because Jesus was a Jew or is a Jew. That was so part of their that teaching. Um, they thought, well, you know, if if anybody was going to uh, believe in him, they had to be a Jew. Exactly. And that's so where that's... the whole circumcision and all the rest of it um, stems from, I think. And that, and that, Chris, by the way, was the teaching of the day. The, the teaching of that day was, well, Jesus was a Jew first. You know, remember, that's what they taught. Okay, so here's the two reasons why. Two reasons why. And Galatians fell into this, okay? And plus everyone else that ever falls away from the gospel. There's two reasons why. One, enticing words. You see, here's the problem. You can be an eloquent speaker, an eloquent teacher, and you can be able to speak amazingly quote scriptures and you can sound here's the problem 
very spiritual and very confusing. Mm -hmm. And this is where, where I agree with where it comes to pride, you see, because what these eloquent speakers do, they speak to your pride and actually convince you that you can actually please God in your own strength. Mm -hmm. And so they'll come up with all these crazy ideas. You got to pay, like Sarah said, you got to pay something, you got to give something, you got to do something to get something. That is only pride because we are taught as human beings, come on, from young, all of us, we agree with this. We are taught nothing for nothing, all right? We are taught from small. If, you go, if you're good, you get rewarded. If you're bad, you get punished, which is not incorrect. I'm not saying that's bad. Don't get me wrong. But understand the teaching from young all the way through. Now you have a gospel that tells you you don't work for it. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. It is paid for in full by Jesus. All you got to do is actually believe. It's too easy for us because we want our part. So here's the problem. In Galatia and in the modern world, the, the, Jew, the Judaizers were eloquent in their speech. They could quote scriptures, yet they warped the truth. That's why, that's why um, um, Paul actually says, you know, it's actually, it's not another gospel. It's not another, it's actually a lie. There's no no good news. There. So that's the first thing. The second reason why people fall into cults is because of a supernatural element to people's lives. Now, we as human beings, I've said it before, we've actually been created for the supernatural. Why, do, why, why I am convinced and I know I'm right by this teaching is because the Bible says we are made in God's image. God is what? He is spirit you and i are spiritual beings we possess a body we live in a body should i say okay and we possess a soul but we are spiritual beings that's why we are eternal when you die you are going to live forever either in heaven or in hell that's the reality so we are spiritual beings and so one of some of the, the cults out there they they use and the next verse we're going to read is going to prove it to you they, 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 there's a supernatural element, but you got to understand demons, the devil can also operate in the supernatural. And so when we get caught up with enticing words and we get caught up with signs, we, we, and we take our eyes off the, the foundation of the gospel, which is only one, there's, there's one foundation. It's Jesus. You take away anything from Jesus. There's no prophet bigger than Jesus. There's no word spoken after the words of Jesus that's greater than the word of Jesus. So if we hold fast, and, and, and Bernard, you're right, if we mature in our understanding of Jesus, we will not fall away. We will not be enticed because we understand the truth of the gospel. Any comments on that? Any questions on that before I read the next verse to you? Yes, Pastor Ron, I also think that... Um... Uh, they give them uh, such a, um, um, a feeling of belong. Everybody wants to belong. Everyone wants to be wanted. And they give them the feeling of belong. So it's so easy to get them actually on the wrong side, if I can call that. And then it's, if that ball's rolled, then it all goes on. Absolutely. You're right. I, I would agree with you 100% there, Morgie. So what happens is people, when you're not fulfilled, this is the problem. If the gospel should be fulfilling to us. Um, the gospel should be sustaining to us. And when you're not fulfilled in yourself, that's why fellowship, and I've been preaching these last couple of weeks on connecting with people. It's important to connect. When you're not connected, when you're not part of a fellowship, when you're not doing things like we're doing, actually communicating, talking to each other, and you're on your own, and then all of a sudden there's this group, just what Morgan is saying, there's this group that, just love on you, accept you, um, you know, then it's very easy to be enticed and brought into a group where the teaching is incorrect and perhaps they're convincing you with signs that are not real signs. So we got to be careful. You know what? Uh, someone once said, don't chase miracles, chase Jesus. And I want to say that again, don't chase miracles. You know, a lot of people move from one church to the next church, to the next church, all because they, they're chasing miracles. They're chasing signs. They're chasing a feeling. And the problem is 
a feeling will not last. A healing won't even last if it's not from Christ. Um, so the reality is we need to remain stable in the state. Now, do I say that there's no signs? Of course, we, there should be signs. This is the problem with the modern church today. There should be signs. There should be healing. There should be deliverance. But it's not up to one man. It's not up to a pastor. It's up to a praying church. And one thing I'm proud of our church, we're praying. So I'm really believe that we're going to see some big and great things take place. So Morgie, you're 100% right. Okay, so with, the, with that whole scenario in our minds, let's listen to the next point on your notes on page eight, number two. There is says this, a repeated condemnation against anyone, and listen to, listen to the brackets, a man, apostle, or angel who would preach a different gospel than that what they have already received, verses 8 and 9. Let's read it together. I'm going to first read from the King James Version. Then I'll read uh, from the Amplified Version. So King James says this, verses 8 and 9. But though we, speaking of the apostles, okay, um, or an angel from heaven, listen to the words, it's very strong, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, than which we have preached unto you, let him be, listen to this very strong word in the King James, accursed. As we have said before and say so now again, if any man preach another gospel unto you, other than you have received, let him be accursed. Now, hold on. Did you notice there's a repetition there? Did you notice that? Now, now, listen, I, I want to teach you something. If the Bible repeats itself, it's big. It's something important. In other words, the author is really trying to get a point across. It's like I'm a public speaker. Anyone who's ever done public speaking before will tell you, if you want to drive home a point, you must repeat it. Can you just see what Paul did there? What did he do? He repeated himself. He made sure that everyone knows certain facts. Listen to the amplified version of uh, verses 8 and 9. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to which we originally preached to you, let him be condemned to destruction. As we have said before, so I now say again, if anyone is preaching to you, a gospel different from that which you have received from us, let him be condemned and to destruction. Okay, so here's the thing. This is Paul saying what's happening with the, the church in Galatians, in Galatia, is so important that they get their lives back on track. Because if you preach a gospel that is pointing away from the gospel, you're in big trouble, both ends, okay? Think about the word angel, even if an angel comes. What is Paul trying to highlight to us? Anyone, can you help me? <coughs> Anyone? Why would he specifically speak about even if an angel comes to you? And it's not um, the speaker that's important. Sorry, it's the scripture that matters. Absolutely. It's the scripture and not the speaker. But what do angels represent? Usually messengers from God. But sometimes yeah. it's, it's a fallen angel. I, I don't know if I can pick on a particular individual. I don't like to do it. But Muhammad had a vision 800 years after or six or 700 years after the word. Uh, and, he, and that angel... Gave him a whole lot of rules. Some of them not weren't all that bad, actually. But he took Jesus from Son of God to a prophet. So I cannot believe that that angel was bringing good news to Muhammad. And I'm not wishing yeah. all Muslims. There's some nice guys out there. But the foundation is wrong. Absolutely. What else do angels that. represent? Yes? I think uh, angels um, are and or were um, understood to be God's messengers. Yes. You're all 100% right. Definitely God's messengers. But let me lead you in my question. Were, were they normal or were they supernatural. supernatural? Okay, so this is what Paul's trying. We need to catch this. 
we need to catch this and we need to understand it because this, remember I said, the two main reasons, and also Morgie's is 100% right, two main reasons why people, especially Christians, fall into the trap of cults and, and get involved in some really strange churches out there is because either very enticing words, the preachers speak so well, eloquent speech, or they follow the supernatural because people think that if there's supernatural, it must be God. Now, I'm not against supernatural, and I must, I must clarify that. So please understand, I believe in the supernatural. I've experienced the supernatural. I've seen God move in a church. My church, my, my previous church I came from, we had about four or 500 people in that particular service. And let me just tell you, a preacher came, never prayed for one person, just prayed a corporate prayer. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, the entire church, the entire church were on their knees, some had fallen, but every person was on the ground because God's presence was so tangible. I know that was real. And what I love about it, the fruit afterward was amazing. You had husbands reconciling with wives. You had people healed. It was powerful. Okay. So I believe in the supernatural, but we do not chase signs. We don't chase wonders. We don't chase miracles because if you do that, uh, let me give you an illustration of what you're doing. If I want to get to Durban and I'm driving to Durban and I see a sign that says Durban 500 kilometers, do you know that that sign is not Durban? <laughs> it's supposed to point me in the right direction to Durban. The church, when they see a sign, they stop at the sign. And a lot of Christians worship the signs instead of being directed to Jesus. And this is where it becomes very dangerous. So, so if we look at Paul's situation, Paul's a little bit different to a supernatural element. Paul is dealing more with a theological teaching. So the teachers were very profound in their words. They were quoting scriptures. But I need to highlight to us that not only do people fall for, uh, uh, for, for a manipulation of scriptures, but people today in our world are falling for the chasing of signs. And that can be dangerous. Is, does anyone disagree with me or want to add something to what I've just said? Okay, so everyone happy with that? You're not? Yes, go, Simon. I just... While you were speaking, I was thinking of Jesus when he was feeding the 5,000 and giving them the bread. But the bread they had was a man or a physical bread. And they really followed him, many of them, the majority, not because they wanted him, the living bread, but because they saw this man can do amazing things. So their motive in many cases was not right. And he pointed it out to them, particularly to the yeah. leaders. That he, he was talking about the bread from life, bread of heaven in John, and him being that bread. And people were just totally taken by his miracles. But the same people turned against him, so, you know, not long after that. And that's the problem. You're so right. If you chase the miracle and you're only serving God because of the miracle, you will, you will abandon your faith quickly because just like Jesus experienced, people were following him because they thought he was just this miracle man. He would bring healing, deliverance, and all that, and which is important. Don't get me wrong. It's great. I, I'm, I'm going to say it again. I'm not against that. Uh, Chris John, will you mute yourself there, my brew, please, if you can. Excuse Thank me? Thank you. Will you just mute yourself? You, you're okay, coming I'm through loud. Myself. Thanks, Chris John. So that's the thing. We can't, we can't just follow the signs. Yes, Mark, you want to go for it? Uh, Satan also masquerades sometimes as an angel of light. Yep, that's what the scripture says. I mean, he, can, he, he does do that. And we've got to be careful that we don't um, fall for that trickery. Okay, so Paul's situation with Galatians, different to that. This is, this is theological debate. These Jews have come in. They know the word. They have used, just like Chris said, in fact, Chris, you're 100% right. Their, their teaching was you must become a Jew first before you become a Christian. And their whole reasoning for that was that the Messiah, which is the truth, the Messiah was a Jew. But oh, the, yeah, exactly. And the thing is, um, he was a Jew, but it, nowhere did Jesus or the, the, the apostles teach you had to become a Jew first to become 
a Christian. That's why there was a huge debate between Peter and Paul and all of the disciples because the Gentiles were being filled with the Spirit. They were speaking in tongues. They were being born again. They, I mean, they became radical for, uh, uh, Christians, followers of, of, of Christ, you know. Um, and so they did not, and the Bible actually teaches you don't have to be circumcised to, to actually become a Christian. Does that make sense? Good. Right. So number three on your notes says this strong words. Yes. But coming from one who seeks to serve Christ and not man. So verse 10 in your, your in six says this for, I do not persuade men for do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men for if I yet please men, I should not be a servant of Christ. So Paul's making the statement. It's a very harsh statement. He's just said, if you're preaching another gospel and he's actually speaking to the Judaizers, if you can imagine that, and they it's hard words because he uses the word cursed, condemned. Um, and that's a big thing for Paul. He has a man of grace. He's preaching the goodness of God. He's preaching uh, you know, all uh, the truth about uh, the new covenant. Yet at the same time, he's saying, if you preach another gospel, you're cursed and you're condemned. So you must understand we, we, we are going to be held accountable by the words that we speak. So Paul clarifies why he's saying this is because who does he has to persuade men or God? He doesn't have to persuade God because God already knows the truth. Okay. He doesn't have to try to please man. He's actually got to be pleasing Christ. Why? Uh, because if he tries to please man, then he shouldn't be a servant of Christ. Does that make sense? Verse 10. Everyone understand verse 10. Lovely. Number two, Paul's defense of his apostleship. Once again, why did Paul have to defend him being an apostle? We've answered it before, but just for the sake of uh, understanding, why should he defend the gospel, who I'll show his apostleship. Anyone? Why did Paul have to defend himself? Paul came later. You know, the first 12 with Peter, James, John, and the rest were there while Jesus was alive. They saw, they walked with Jesus. And then Paul came and met the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. So he had a, a later experience. So in some people's eyes, particularly, I think, Jewish believers, his credentials might have been questioned. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, also, Brian, um, yeah. he persecuted the Christians radically before he actually had that Damascus Road experience. So a absolutely. lot of them were very suspicious of him. Yeah, the, the, the self-righteousness so, issue came to, um, yeah, yeah. Came to the fore. That's Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So the so the the reality is that they would have challenged his authority, and this is a problem even in today's world. A lot of people want to challenge authority, so they would have chat. They would challenge his authority uh, in terms of preaching word. They would have also used used examples like this. They would have said this. Look, look. Let's look at Peter. Peter spent three years with Jesus. Paul, who's Paul? Paul didn't spend any time with Jesus. How the heck can he come here and now tell us that he's an apostle? He knows what he's talking about. No, 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 no. We got we to gotta stick to the original apostles, which is Peter, uh, James. Uh, once again, who's Paul? I mean, if, if you think about it logically, there must have been a lot of attack mm -hmm. on, on Paul. Uh, especially his authority. But isn't it amazing that two thirds of the New Testament is actually written by Paul? Hasn't God got a sense of humor? <laughs> you know, one of the greatest apostles was someone who did not spend as much time as the other apostles did with Jesus. I mean, and, and you know what? Okay, I'm going to ask you a question. I know it's off the subject, <clears throat> but Jesus shared a parable that actually explains why Paul was an equal with the other apostles. What parable was that? Come on, try, someone try to help me. Come on, come on. I'm testing you tonight. Come on, this is a good test. The prodigal son. 
The work okay. The, the workers. workers. The workers in the vineyard. Yes, the workers in the vineyard. Remember the first guys that came early, they were working. Then two, three hours later, another group come and they start working. And then someone comes literally two hours before knockoff time. And when it comes to pay, remember, the, remember now, comes to pay, Jesus gives them all the same amount. And the guys who got there first were like, ah, oh, no, this is not fair. You know what? We spent all this time. And uh, you giving us a hundred rand and the oak who worked two hours is also getting a hundred rand. That's not fair. And that's when Jesus rebuked them and actually, or used the illustration to rebuke them, that he's the rewarder. The, the guys who worked early um, are just privileged to be able to work and earn money. So he is the rewarder. And so Paul, he might've come late on the scene, but literally his testimony shook the known world it it, it it there was a big shaking that took place because here's a guy that absolutely persecuted christians hated them mm -hmm. there was not a person alive then that literally uh knew the old covenant the the old testament better than someone like paul do some research you will notice that paul had a teacher so uh, you guys can do this when you get later on, on uh, just go research paul had a teacher um, I'm going to use his name, but go and research a guy named Galileo. I think that was the guy's name. He was, <laughs> am I right? Okay. He was one of the, the, the teachers of the day of the law. There wasn't anyone be better. And Paul literally was his understudy. So here's Paul, uh, who was Saul. Okay. So what a testimony that is of God's goodness and grace. More importantly, God's grace. Paul, better than Peter, better than John, better than any apostle, actually understood grace at a deeper level than they would ever did because he always had to live with the fact that he murdered Christians. He, in his eye, Paul actually says in one or another letter that he felt he's like one of the worst of the worst, yet Jesus still saved him. Can you see why? Uh, he, I believe he had authority, and this is what he's going to explain now uh, to the people maybe questioning. Any other comments on that? Yes, he, he was almost like a Moses um, of the Christian church to deliver them from this bondage of legalism. Oh, very good, Anne. That's a good statement. Anyone else, Simon? <clears throat> Go for it, Simon. Sorry, sorry, I was unmuting. May I, may I put in a word of defense for Peter? <laughs> yes, that no, for sure. No, okay. I'm not. I'm not attacking Peter, by the way. No, no, I'm no. Just no giving I know Paul's that. defense. You know that Paul was a great theologian, <laughs> and, and Peter was the anointed fisherman. Yeah. Um, when Jesus, I wanted to put a little bit of context in here um, because I've got a bit of a Jewish thing in me, as you know. When Peter, when Jesus was interacting with the twelve, at that point, this is he has not yet been resurrected. He has not yet. Had the, the Holy Spirit come and give the gospel of grace to all mankind, because that was coming still. What did he say to the 12 disciples? He said, go to the lost sheep of Israel. They are the ones I want you to start with. So the very first thing that Peter and, and the apostles did was preach the gospel of good news to the Jews. Later we yes. know everything changed. So Peter yes. had a certain historical perspective and he it took time for that to change because he was a good Jew, <laughs> kept kosher and he said, oh, eat and, uh, unclean food he needed to yeah. change his mind and remember he wasn't a theologian he was just a highly anointed fisherman so that's I, I, right I, I do have a soft i have a love for, for peter sorry yeah simon you simon there. you can defend him it's good there's no problem with that i'm just explaining paul's predicament of being someone that wasn't with jesus and a lot of people would have seen that as a weakness so on your notes there uh number two paul's defense of his apostleship a the divine origin of his gospel number one his gospel was not according to man or from man but directly from jesus verses 11 to 12 so let's read it, it says this but i certain but I, what's it certify you brethren that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, so there's a key word in all that. What do you think that key word in those two verses is? 
Revelation. Revelation. Yeah. Absolutely. There's a, uh, there's a word that is used in terms of preaching. Um, you have a Logos word, which is the written word. What's the word do you think that fits in nicely with that word revelation? Someone help me. Rhema. Rhema. Yes. A, and what does rhema mean? Come on, all the theologians in this group. What is a rhema word? Come on, help me. Uh, the personal and revealed word to you. I think that's how I would see it. A rhema okay. to you would be personal revelation to you from God, not from some weird angel. Okay, that's anyone else? Prophecy. Okay, anyone else? Encounter. Yes, it can, it's definitely got to do with encounter. Absolutely. What else? Anointed. Anointed, definitely. So if you really want to understand what rhema, it's, it's literally a now word. It's a word spoken now. It's, it's literally, you know, a written word is for now, for sure. Um, but did you know that sometimes when you read a written word, sometimes that written word speaks to you now in your situation now it's a it's a revelation of now because you 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 in this group i know you've all experienced this you will read a, a passage of scripture 20 30 times then all of a sudden one day something happens in your life you open the bible and as you read the scripture it comes alive to you now okay that's a rhema word. It, it is validated now. The Lord speaking to you now. And will a rhema word contradict the logos word? Understand logos means written word. No, so just no. confirm it. <clears throat> Absolutely. And this is the beauty of our Paul's teaching, Peter's teaching, the apostles teaching. They only had one Bible to preach from. They could only preach from the Old Testament. There was no New Testament. This is important. Guys, ladies, please take note. The preachers of that day only had one Bible, and it was the Old Testament. Yet they preached a gospel that touched and changed the whole world because of a rhema word, a word that was for now. When I talk about now, which when, when they were preaching, it was a now word. Often they would preach, quote, Old Testament scriptures. And even the theologians of the day, the Jewish theologians of the day, could not answer the questions. They couldn't um, contradict the word that they spoke because the rhema word is often a spirit-filled word. I mean, that, that's key. It's a spirit-filled world. So when, when Paul preached the gospel to them, what he's saying is simply the revelation that he got. The, the, and by the way, what, what does the word revelation mean? Anyone? Unveiling. Unveiling, a revealing. So in other words, there was an unveiling, a revealing of the gospel of Jesus Christ to Paul directly from who? Who gave him that? Who actually spoke to him? Jesus himself. Jesus. Jesus himself. Okay, so here's the thing. Peter, James, John, all these guys, they got revelation from Jesus himself. Paul, in fact, was no different to them. Obviously, he didn't spend three years with them, but understand they also only had a revelation of who Jesus really was when. When? When did they get the true revelation of who Jesus was? When he came back from the dead. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And also remember, uh, a true revelation is definitely Jesus Christ resurrected, for sure. But what about the infilling of the Holy Spirit? He said, go wait until you receive power. They had a full revelation of Christ in his resurrection and the anointing power that they received paul received both now think about this when he when he was knocked off his horse or donkey whatever it was he had a revelation of what the resurrection of jesus and he was filled with god's power in that moment so he, he, what he's trying to show them is that hey, i am an apostle okay so number two in your note a review of his conduct in Judaism prior to his conversion, okay? So in other words, he is now saying 
Okay. He's, he's, Paul's very clever. He's building an argument. He's saying, guys, first of all, the revelation I got wasn't from man. The gospel that I received wasn't a man-made idea. It was from Jesus himself. Okay. And then all of a sudden he's now, but let me tell you some of my credentials. So verse uh, 13 and 14, King James says this, for you have heard of my conversion in times past in the Jews, Jews religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited it in the Jews religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the tradition of my fathers. In other words, what he's saying to these guys that have been convinced to go back to the law, Paul is saying, above everyone else, guys, I was more zealous for the law than you. Very important. Understand. Listen to what he's saying to the guys. When it comes to law, I was far ahead of you. I was more zealous. I was more excited. I had more passion. I had more drive. I had, you name it, when it came to the law. Would anyone here disagree with that statement? Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's just the reality. He was, I mean, he even murdered the Christians because he hated the Christians because they were, in his mind, contradicting the law. Only one way to please God, and that was through the law, which was impossible, but that's what he felt. Now this gospel comes out, he hated it. Yet the same guy that hated the gospel is now serving Jesus through grace. Isn't that powerful, guys? Doesn't it excite you? <laughs> okay. Um, what else can we learn from those scriptures? Okay. Um, anyone want to say something before we carry on? All right. Then we are all going to carry on. Let's go to number three in your notes. Upon his conversion and act of divine revelation itself, he did not confer with man, especially the apostles in Jerusalem. So reading from verse 15 to 17. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, who called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Why is this important? Why, why does he tell them that he didn't wait for man? Okay. He didn't wait for approval from man. He went ahead and did it. Why is that important? Anyone? I think it's also, it, it is to... Um really show that he really had that encounter with the, with the Lord. It, and, and he's speaking out of um, what he actually experienced. It wasn't uh, by hearsay mm. uh, in Jerusalem. It's what he really experienced. So it's out of his real heart. And, and he believed that he was called from since the beginning of time. It wasn't just for then. But it's just since the beginning of time. Absolutely. I, Good. I, yes. I agree with I agree with Mulvey and I also think that he's um stressing that he's on the authority, supernatural authority. That's the authority on which he is speaking to him. He's definitely doing that, yeah. What else? All right, catch this, understand this. Paul preach the gospel okay the gospel let's let's not focus on who he was preaching to leave the gentiles out for a moment just for a moment just for a moment okay but he preached a gospel that peter james john every apostle would have been 100 percent in agreement with yet he was not taught by any of those apostles understand what he's doing understand where he's coming from He's see i i i went to bible school i studied i had a, a a pastoral father figure over me that trained me in the ministry i had someone that spoke into my life um etc 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 paul who did he have when he was Saul? anyone Nobody. he had no one he had well, no see, one 
Yeah. Yes, go for it. I think, I think yeah, I, I, the, the point is that um, those apostles were taught by Jesus himself. Yes. And Paul, at the time these guys were being taught, Paul was totally 180 degrees against the whole issue, against the whole uh, 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 philosophy. So when Paul was um, um, converted... Um, the revelation, first of all, came from Jesus himself. Yep. Um, and so I, I imagine that the disciples couldn't understand why Paul didn't come to them to be taught what Jesus, because they were witnesses. Absolutely. Um, why, and that... they, why he didn't come back to them. He went off into the Bundu for X number of years not and those those disciples didn't understand that he was in fact being taught by Jesus himself in terms of um, uh, of what they were doing but exactly. was, that, that's why they that's why they were they, they were they were espousing the same gospel yeah, exactly and the apostles together exactly and, and and that was the point so the point that he's making is that guys i didn't go to the apostles first i didn't go to jerusalem first yeah okay i started preaching this gospel which is the exact now this is the miracle part and we got to catch this we actually got to understand this here's the miracle part about saul who became paul he didn't spend three years receiving from Jesus. He wasn't in the upper room when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. He, 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 he didn't go and particularly listen to the preaching of the gospel. In fact, he fought against it. The Jewish culture of the day, and Simon, you will back me up on this, when, when Jews went to the synagogue and someone started preaching something contrary to what you believe, you would shout them down. You would literally stand up and shout. So Paul, you must understand, he didn't have a heart that was open to the gospel, or should I say Saul, never had a, a heart that was open to the gospel. All he wanted to do was fight it, okay? So he never really listened to it. Let's be honest. You don't really listen when you want to fight something. So Paul is highlighting the fact, hey, guys, the very fact that I wasn't trained by the apostles, the very fact that I wasn't under Jesus' earthly ministry, yet I'm able to preach with pure revelation should show you that what I have received is, in fact, directly from Jesus. Does, can, can you see the argument? Can you see how he's speaking to these Galatians who have been, whose mind has been warped by Jewish teachers? Can you see what he's doing? That's important. Okay, so we're going to end off there. If there's any other questions, please ask now uh, before we close. Is everyone happy? Can I yes. Okay, go ahead. You first, then Bernard. Yeah. Um, Henry. When, when uh, Saul was um, had that revelation, thrown off his horse, blinded, and he went into the wilderness, he must have been, mine must have been in turmoil. Absolutely. Now what's going on? And he had to have that time alone to talk to God and to say, What's going on, Lord? What, what must I do? And the revelations given to him by God through that period in the wilderness in Arabia. set him up for ministry. Absolutely. Who was his teacher? Holy Spirit. Jesus mm -hmm. actually said that. He taught that, that I will leave you another comforter and he will teach you all mm -hmm. things pertaining to the kingdom. So that was his teacher. Okay, Bernard, you were going to say? Uh, and I was just like thinking about the point of like um, Paul, when he got like saved, um, he didn't like go look for other things, like the Galatians are looking now for other things. Yeah, Something exactly. Like he was totally fulfilled with the gospel. Exactly. And they should be totally fulfilled with the gospel. Anyone else? Brilliant. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for this wonderful, wonderful evening. Sorry it took long to get online. I hope I didn't lose some people in the beginning. I had a 